Welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Today's episode is episode number 47 and we'll be looking at destiny, chance, randomness and we'll have a mystery guest as well as our regular contributor, Anthony. Thanks for joining us. Settle down, relax and enjoy the show. Anthony, how's it going? I'm pretty well, Scott. How are you? Very good, thanks. Yeah, I'm back in London now, um, relaxing with friends and um, taking it easy, just re- recouping and um, recharging my batteries. What about you? I can't imagine why you have to recoup after six months in Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> That's harsh. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm just joking. Um, I'm good. I'm in Poland, which is one of my favorite places to be. I really, I really love Poland. I haven't been here for a few years, so... Yeah, I'm I'm doing happy Polish dance at the moment. I, I I understand you've been cycling across Poland, right? Uh yeah, I started in Prague and I cycled across to Katowice, which is sort of like southwest Poland, uh, and then caught a train up here to to Warsaw, where I am now. And have you managed to um, see any sights on the way? I've seen a lot. Um, but uh, we talked about this before the show. I wanted to briefly mention that I that I was in. Um, I was in Auschwitz, which is where the Auschwitz uh, um, concentration camp was located during World War II. So I went to do the Auschwitz tour, uh, and it was a very interesting experience, of course. Uh, it was a little distasteful in some ways, I mean, for, for, the, for very obvious reasons, <laughs> but, you know, a million people died there, and, but also the, the sort of commercialism of it was, was a little off. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting. I got, I got involved in a conversation with, uh, one of the, one of the tour guides there. Uh, and I, I asked him, um, whether he any, whether he ever has guests on his tours who say that none of this ever happened, you know, uh, that the Holocaust is made up. Uh, and he told me, and I was a little surprised to hear this actually, um, he had been doing guided tours for nine years and he hadn't had a single person say that. Not a maybe, single. maybe they wouldn't want to say that on a tour though. Well, I was, yeah, I was thinking that too. Obviously, obviously, you know, um, you might not want to bring that up <laughs> in a, in a group of 20 people, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, it was it was very interesting. You know, I, I said to him, you know, if if somebody did say that to you, what would your response be? And he said, I, I just I just don't know what I would say because you know these people, they say you know that that beer canal, uh, which is the you know the bigger part of the camp, uh, beer canal is just an enormous railway station and 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 things like this. But uh, yeah, I mean, when you're actually in the in the location, it does seem that. I mean, I, I think we should do a separate episode on denial, on Holocaust denial and, and, and other forms of denial because, you know, it's a very, uh, it's a very complex issue and it's something that, um, you know, we obviously can't really cover adequately in five minutes. But I, I will say that, uh, that it's, it, it, there's a lot of specific details that you can look at and think, all right, well, that could have been something else. Yeah. So you look at a particular building and you go, all right, they're saying this building was used for purpose X. But looking at it, it could have been used for purpose Y. Yeah. Hmm. So you look at these things in isolation, they can be potentially explained in other ways. But if you put the whole puzzle together, you just think, wow, that is, that is an awful lot of explaining to do. If this isn't a death camp, then, then, you know, there's, there's a, <laughs> there's a, a lot of alternate, alternate explanations to be rolled into one to explain it in any other way, you know? Yeah, indeed. Um, did you go to both sites? You know, um, when you visit Auschwitz, you normally get taken to two different sites, yeah? Yes, yeah, yeah. We went to, we went to both of them, the, the, the actual Auschwitz and then, uh, Birkenau, which was the, the, you know, by far the, the bigger camp with the, with the big railway station and the, um, the latrines, and, and I'm sure you remember, because I know you've been there, I'm sure you remember the, the latrines, you know, 217 holes in the ground where you, you can spend 30 seconds a day, <laughs> and then, 
the um the what would they call them the Scheisse patrol i think they call them <laughs> um comes in and just cleans it out and they have the best job because they're working indoors not outdoors it was all, it was all, all a bit confronting yeah the, course, the, the, that section it does kind of um bring things home like how how degrading it would be like to be treated like cattle basically um but yeah the second site Birkenau brings home the size of the camp um yeah, it's a very it's a very touchy subject and and difficult really. Um, again, I think it's like a lot of the topics we discuss. Uh, discuss. You can you know if you if you want to take the view that, that all the figures are wrong or you know there's there's something to be disputed, then you can find people who support that and and you can find people in the opposite and you have to make a choice at the end of the day. Seems like that with a lot of the topics we discuss really. I agree, I, and I think um, I mean I was I was looking before at. Um at a couple of uh, websites that, that have polled their visitors and the question has been, you know, should should Holocaust denial be illegal? And on the websites that I looked at, the, the majority of people said yes. And it is illegal in a number of countries, you know, in 14 European countries, for example, it's illegal. And in some of those countries, you can go to prison. In Austria, you can go to prison for up to 10 years if you say that the Holocaust didn't happen. Uh, well, this reminds me of, um, well, uh, my, my feelings are fairly clear on this. I'll, I'll ask you what you think in a minute, but I, I just cannot understand why people think it's a good idea to legislate what people should think and beliefs people should have. I mean, but I, I also, going back to Ukraine that we were discussing earlier before the show, um, I noticed they're starting to make it illegal for certain um, singers and uh, performers to appear on TV uh, based on their political views. And I, I think when you start going down that route, you, you're just making a big mistake. And I think the same with Holocaust denial. I'm not a Holocaust denier, by the way. Uh, I want to make that clear. But if someone wants to think that or, or talk about it or discuss it, they should. it's, it's within their rights. Um, what do you think, uh, Anthony? Well, look, I, I think it's something to discuss in another episode. I'm, I, I, would, I, I tend to agree with you, but I... I don't think that the other side of the argument is entirely invalid either. However, there are essentially two kinds of laws that cover this. In some countries, there are very uh, there are very explicit Holocaust denial laws, and they say if you deny the Holocaust, this is what may happen to you in a in a court. Uh, and then there are other countries. Australia is one of them. Um, Bosnia Herzegovina is another one. Strangely. Um, they and France as well. They they prosecute uh, Holocaust deniers under wider laws, and these laws, uh, in the case of France, for example, I was just looking at this before. Maybe I can find it. Uh, in the case of France, um, so it's illegal to to question the occurrence of any crime that can be defined as a crime against humanity and that last bit is a quote that's the french law so there you're really opening up a pandora pandora's box because you're making it much broader it's not only illegal to deny the holocaust it's a, it's illegal to deny anything which the majority view would see as a crime against humanity and that just shuts down a whole range of, of you know historical debates and i imagine in, in some cases might make it quite dangerous to be a historian who's really interested in uncovering the truth. I think it's, uh, I'll be honest, I think it's stupid to, to legislate against what people think. It's just stupid. You're not going to change what they think. All you're going to do is try and make them silent. Um, it just it just seems bonkers to me, but um, yeah, I am becoming a little bit more anarchistic, as you know, so... Um, <laughs> And a lot of people, a lot of people uh, make have have made the point on these websites that you know if you let Holocaust deniers just speak freely about what they believe, the vast majority of the population is going to go, "Wow, they're idiots," and so they're not going <laughs> to they're not going to do themselves a lot of favors by being allowed to speak out loud. Of course, they won't. They will, you know, uh, they'll be speaking to to their audience, but the, but it's not. But a lot of people have made the point, and I think there's some truth to it, that you, these people are not going to turn mainstream society's attitudes around. It's just not going to happen. Well, the other thing is, it could be used for nefarious purposes, that kind of legislation. I mean, yes. um, why don't we make climate change denial or, or people who disagree with 
any topic you know like uh, you know you're going to start to get basically you have to have the mainstream uh, consensus on every topic otherwise you're in danger of uh, the yep. law coming down, it's just, it's just silly to me. I think that's a really fri frightening prospect, and that's what worries me about these laws like the French one. Not so much the very targeted one, like the law in Austria, um, and obviously in Germany, um, but the, the, the broader ones like the French one, they, they worry me a lot. And in terms of climate change, that's, that's a really interesting one, because you can almost see it happening. But, but fascinatingly, and we've had this discussion, I think, a few times in different forms, it seems that in the UK, the orthodoxy is you must believe in climate change, right? Increasingly, in Australia, the orthodoxy is you must doubt climate change. And you can almost see them diverging in different you know, directions and going, all right, now, <laughs> in the UK, if you deny climate change, then, then you know, we're going to fine you for that. And in, the, and in Australia, going, if you make you know, um, unsupported or, or, or exaggerated claims about climate change, then we're going to fine you for that, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I remember um, we, were, we were discussing another topic, and uh, I think it was the royal family, and uh, I think we both realised that we, we do read different media. You read the uh, Australian version, and I, I read the UK version, and the royal family, we get bombarded every day here in the UK about how amazing they are, how, how fantastic they are, and so I kind of, I rebel against that. And uh, mm. but you tend to not see that so much, um, and you, you see the sort of you know outside view a bit more. But it's good to have the different perspectives. It absolutely is. My my perception uh, with um, the the UK press and the royal family, and I may be wrong, but my perception is that basically Murdoch hated them, uh, and since Murdoch has been disgraced in the UK, there's been a kind of swing the other way, to a pro royal family swing. Because I would he, say I would say there was, um, there was a point in the 80s where he basically said. I'm going to bring down the Queen using my my media empire. Well, recently with that that Hitler, the, the you know the Heil Hitler salute, that's that was fairly out of the blue over here in the UK that any UK newspaper would would start to print that stuff. So that was actually a bit of a shock here in the UK. Mostly, mm. it's usually uh, they they've got uh, Clarence House, the royal family's uh, PR office, um, deal with the media and they they make sure that regularly everything's pumped out is positive. And that mm. was a bit of a shock. Um, so no, I think maybe he, maybe Rupert Murdoch gets away with that abroad, but not in the UK as, as so much. But something's changed in the last um, couple of well, months. So. Looks of it. I think so because I, I do remember the 80s when I mean Mur Murdoch was, I suppose I suppose that that was when he really became you know established as the media mogul that he that he is. I mean they were f the 80s were just packed with royal scandals, you know, just one after the other. Oh uh, yeah, the royal scandals. Um, th th some sometimes those were kind of um, they weren't so bad in a way. They were kind of like the soap opera of royal royal life, and um, they weren't quite as damaging as um, people might think. I don't think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, it a lot worse from the outside than it was from the inside. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say we're we're a bit strapped for time, so we should probably move on to our main topic that we were going to discuss. Ooh, uh, yes. And, um, you know, we were talking about um, Holocaust denial and how people, you know, have may, maybe should have the right to believe what they want to believe and express their thoughts and their mind, and that kind of takes us on to whether we do actually have the ability to express our thoughts and our mind and our, and our will and our free will. <laughs> um, and I think that's what you were going to talk about, right? I am going to talk about that, uh, uh, and it is it is a very very heavy topic. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm just I'm just laughing at, at something about Donald Trump, which I was just looking up on Google. Um, <laughs> well, do tell do tell before we. I'll, we I'll tell you later in the context okay, of free okay, will. Sure. Um, <laughs> so look, yeah, we um, this is we, we've touched on this in a few different episodes. So I guess we you know. Um, decided in the in the space of a few conversations that we it might be time to just just go straight for it. So let's uh, let's start by having a look at the the basic concept, though it may you know seem a little obvious. Uh, basically, if free will exists in, in human affairs, it means that that you and I are both the the conscious sources of our own thoughts and actions. So so what we think and what we do comes from us and we have a choice about it. Now, 
believe it or not, <laughs> in saying that, we already strike huge problems. <laughs> Um, and a lot of scientists and philosophers and other folks have agonized over this. And the problem is basically that the, the idea of this conscious agency where we, we decide what we're going to do doesn't actually fit into anything else we know about the universe. So, <laughs> so basically, what we know is that the universe is an interplay of deterministic events and indeterministic events. And starting with determinism, it's when... It, Every result has an earlier cause. So you can trace anything you observe back to those causes in kind of a logical order if you know enough about the system that you're looking at. And it works for, you know, it works for everything from molecules to forests. Uh, and, and for a long time, that's basically how scientists thought the universe was, you know, the, the clockwork universe where everything can be traced back to its logical, logical prior cause. Now, if you apply that to human affairs and to neurology, you get the idea that every human decision and every human action is an inevitable and necessary consequence of earlier states. And if that's the case, then we aren't free to act as we want, because different earlier events will produce certain effects, whether we like it or not. So the whole of history, and even cosmology, becomes this huge chain of causes and effects. Now, to, to bring it down to the human level, and, and we can look at a fairly extreme example, uh, because this, you know, this, this will really sort of bring it into focus, I suppose. If you take a psychopath who kills someone, on the deterministic model, he's a necessary product of his genes and his upbringing, and all of those happen via cause and effect. So on a genetic level, you know, um, his paternal grandmother met his paternal grandfather, they had sex, <laughs> um, his maternal uh, grandfather and grandmother did the same, then their offspring met each other, they had sex, produced the psychopath, and he had no say at all in the genes that produced him. And then on the upbringing level, well, we could go through, you know, a similar chain of events, but it would be a much longer one, full of, you know, all the things that happened to him in his childhood, and the things his parents did to him, and the experiences that he had, and the real world when he was, you know, dating as a teenager, entering the workplace, and so on. You put all of those things together, and you come up with a person who can only be that person, and therefore can only uh, act in a certain way. So you put that person in a situation where they have an opportunity to kill, or maybe they engineer that situation. Yeah? Either way, they can only do what their genes and their social experiences have primed them to do. So to, to, uh, to step away and not kill at that moment, they would have to be a completely different person. To change the outcome, you'd have to have God reaching down and plucking the psychopath out of the situation and putting someone else there instead. I'd like to uh, interject at this point, but I know, I know there's, there's more to it, but... Um um, I just wanted to comment so far on that. I, I've heard some of these um, these th theories and philosophies, and, and just on on what's been said so far, um, yep. I just wanted to say that I I don't see that at all. Uh, it seems to me that I know these these guys are scientists and they do lots of experiments, and, I, and maybe you'll you you may mention an experiment which I know has uh, caused some ripples uh, recently, but. These, it seems to me these are clearly influences, not uh, things that leave people with absolutely no um, decisions or choices to make. Not that, you know, I mean, we can, we can talk about whether people actually do make decisions, but these are, in, these are clearly influences, you know, upbringings. There, there's plenty of people who have had similar upbringings and, um, you know, similar genetics and similar influences. At the end of the day, you can still make a decision. You can still make a choice whether to kill someone. I, I think it's, it's dangerous, um, it's dangerous philosophy to accept without discussion. And I, and I think there's no problem with, um, with these uh, neuroscientists coming up with theories as long as they don't start preaching it as fact because I think it's potentially dangerous. Well, okay, let's, yeah, let's, let's talk a bit later about the, um, the danger because there is a danger. There's, there's a huge moral danger, especially when it comes to criminal justice. Yeah. Uh, and it, it is a very thorny issue. Um, which I want to go into with you. Uh, but, 
You're right. We there are there are choices involved, uh, but this argument doesn't mean that we act as robots. It means that the choices that we make are the only choices that that we can make. So so let's let's imagine as a counterexample someone who's potentially a killer and goes off to get help or finds themselves in a really loving romantic relationship that 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 you know is a kind of sanctuary. Uh, and somehow manages to avoid becoming a danger to society. That person had no choice either. Given who they were, they were always going to be attracted to the person with whom they ended up in the relationship. They were always going to get to the point where they realized they needed help. Uh, this is just the person they are. So, so that person made better choices because they are that person. That's the argument. Just a quick advert break. Our email is scottsentinel9 at gmail.com. Check out our past episodes. We've got lots of interesting guests and you can find us on YouTube on two channels. We talk about conspiracies, mysteries, injustices, corruption, religion, war, peace. You can leave your own message and we can base our show around what you think. That's what we intend to do. Help us find the truth in the news. Find our YouTube channels, we've got all the episodes on there, Truth Sentinel and Truth Sentinel 1. Subscribe to both so you get notified of everything. Click on the About section, you'll find all the links. Have you got something you'd like to advertise? If it's truth related, honest and ethical, get in contact. You can help us, we can help you. We sell our own t-shirts with the greatest enemy of truth is blind belief in authority on the back. Just $20 um, plus postage and packing. Let us know your size, just send us an email, we can sort it out. We've also teamed up with truthtshirts.com and um, they make political t-shirts. Let people know where you stand basically. Use the code TRUTH1, you get a 10% discount and we get a donation. They make all kinds of political t-shirts and they can customise them for you as well. If you've got any ideas for publicity stunts, get in contact. We need to escalate this channel, make it much bigger. We need your help. Please support us. Thank you. Now, obviously, there are problems <laughs> with this with this view of the universe. One of them is that the universe isn't completely deterministic. <laughs> we know this. Um, we know that um, not everything that happens in the world is a strict chain of cause and effect. Yeah? And actually, one of the biggest uh, scientific developments of the 20th century was that scientists started to understand and discover more of indeterminism in the structure of the world yeah? and and that allowed them to kind of mellow out and refine this kind of clockwork view of the universe that they had before in, in particular um, in the field of quantum mechanics which of course began in the 20th century now that, that was huge because lots of things that happen in the quantum world don't obey laws of cause and effect they're indeterministic as far as we can tell to, to take up your your um, your comment about scientists, I completely agree. Whenever we talk about science, we can only talk about the current state of scientific knowledge of the world. Uh, and and I mean, this is one example. Uh, it's possible that 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 these quantum particles are obeying rules of cause and effect that we just don't understand because we're not smart enough. That's always possible. Well, on that topic, I'd like to make another comment about us mm -hmm. not being smart enough. Yeah. I think that's part of the problem. Um, I, I think we should really steer away from any, making any confident uh, decisions on whether there's free will or not, um, because we don't possess the, we haven't reached the stage in um, in, our, in our development of technology on, or in a development of our own minds to make these calls. I mean, like um, I, I was, you know, I, I was listening to Sam Harris. Um, talk about um, the experiments where they got people under MRI scanners to choose left and right uh, at random um, yeah. and um, to to identify which letter of the alphabet um, they saw when they made the decision so they get different letters of the alphabet flashing up they make the decision where they're going to press the left and right button and then um, when they make that decision they've got to um, look and see which uh, letter 
they that w- was flashing up when they made the decision mm-hmm. and they observed that there was um some activity some brain activity before the decision was made and they seem to be making a lot of conclusions out of this um pertaining to free will and that um you know really the decision was made long before or 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 even a short time before they actually made their decision and so they sam harris kept saying so you're not the author of your thoughts and i i thought it was fairly ridiculous really that that, that they think they can we we don't even understand these MRI scans fully yet. You can't identify a specific thought, for example, and and then say, oh, that guy's thinking about what he's having for dinner tonight. You know, we can only really identify rare, very very basic thoughts with an MRI scanner, and to come up with such huge um, huge conclusions based on that, I think, is really silly. And it kind of annoys me about science sometimes that. <laughs> That these these kind of things are made, and then and then scien- new scientists and neuroscientists talk about them with confidence. That's the problem for me. It's like I I have no problem with them saying, could this mean that we ha we don't actually have free will and we don't actually author our own decisions? But it seems to me they sometimes say, yeah, we're not really the author of our decisions. You know. Well, yeah. I mean, look, there's there's um. You're right about MRIs. I don't think we're at the point yet where we can identify a thought and, and say what it is. I think we're more at the stage that the that the um, you know more like what the NSA claims it does with messages. It doesn't understand the content of the message. It just goes, oh look, there's a message. But <laughs> I think that's what probably what, what's happening with MRIs. But but a little bit more precise than that. We're we're certainly on our way. Uh, in terms of um, in terms of things that we do understand very well, quantum mechanics. Is one. Um, we we can say that we understand it well because it it has proved to be essential in the production of like a whole raft of 20th century inventions. So like everything from LED displays, transistors, which of course were the basis of radio, lasers, solar cells, thermoelectric materials, polymers, digital cameras, all these things just couldn't have been invented unless we understood quant- the indeterminism of quantum mechanics. None of it would work, and none of it could have been conceived. So if you, if you have a whole bunch of real-world stuff that is there because of this idea, then you have to go, well, that's, that's a fairly firm idea. Yeah. And people who want to, uh, who, who like the idea of free will, which I think is most of us, um, might feel like, well, look, here we see not everything is straight cause and effect. Some things just happen because they happen. So, you know, that kills the that kills this argument that we can only be who we are because of this, this, this chain of cause and effect. But actually, it puts another problem in front of us, uh, something which is called the randomness objection. If you say that things are indeterministic, then what you're saying is that some things truly are random and they're the product of blind chance. Now, quantum events happen in that way, uh, as far as we understand them. And again, there is the possibility that we just don't understand them well enough. Uh, but it, it works in, in some parts of the macro world too. For example, weather forecasts are only estimates of probability because our weather systems are indeterministic and population dynamics are the same. We can, we can predict rises and falls of population, but only based on probability because they're not deterministic. And then there's things like, you know, the half-life of radioactive elements and things like this. And again, lots of good invention and, and lots of good um, work has, has been based on that stuff. But the thing is, if you accept indeterminism, then you've got a universe where some things have a, a, strictly, a strictly defined cause and everything else is just chance. So again, in that universe, you can't really say, well, people choose their thoughts and actions. They, they just think stuff and they do stuff, you know. <laughs> so either way, free will, free will just doesn't fit if you, accept, if you accept a deterministic universe or not. This free will thing, it's either a huge anomaly that works in a completely different way to everything else we know of in the world, or it's an illusion. And yeah, yet, um, mm-hmm. I think... Um one thing that Sam Harris didn't mention when talking about a lot of these topics uh, was that we can choose our influences. I mean, he may argue that we don't truly choose anything, but um, <laughs> we can choose our influences. So whilst you can say someone's upbringing and uh, what they watched on TV and you know what they read and their, their genetics and um, 
everything uh, led them to this point. People also assuming we have any kind of choice, which I think we, per, I personally think we do. They can in, they can decide on what they're going to read, where they're going to go, um, how it, you know, and all these things affect their decisions in the future. But they made those choices about their influences too, and they also made choices about, for example, whether to leave a violent partner or um, you know decisions about their life previous to that. So they they had a say in their in their um, in their life before yeah, coming to this, this point. Sort of misses the point of the argument. Or, or, or it's a it's a refutation of the argument. It's one or the other. <laughs> um, the 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 point of the argument is not people don't make choices. It's it's that people can only make the choice that they can make. So so if you left a relationship that was making you unhappy, you being you could only have done that. The, another person, you might look at another person who stayed in a relationship that made them unhappy and go, well, they could choose to leave like I did. But they're a different person. They're not going to do that because of who they are. That's the argument. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 um, it's slightly confusing. I must admit, when I was listening to Sam Harris, I, I, it does become slightly confusing as to what he's saying, but he did seem to be alluding that we don't actually make decisions but based on this uh, experiment that was done that the decision was being made somewhere else we weren't uh, he, he kept saying we're not an author of that decision of those thoughts we don't actually author our thoughts so uh, yes. if someone tells you to think of a number between one and ten it's not actually you that's coming up with that number it the, the MRI scanner was kind of he was he seemed to be in, strongly implying that you you don't decide on the on the number it come pops into your head so uh, he didn't say where it's coming from but um well another way to look at it is 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 in a sort of Freudian union way uh maybe a union way <laughs> because if we looked at it in a Freudian way we'd have to take cocaine first um uh I mean Jung was really big on this idea that that our subconscious controls us so that is still us but his his ideas were that very often we don't know the motivations of what we do. We we uh, we consciously choose to take a particular action, but a whole bunch of subconscious contemplation has gone into that, none of which has ever reached the threshold of consciousness. And I think maybe Sam Harris is trying to say a similar thing, but coming at it from a different angle. You know, Jung was coming at it from this kind of depth psychology angle. Harris is coming at it from a neuroscience angle. But they're sort of saying very similar things. So, so they are still our choices, but we're not always, we're not conscious of what drove us towards that choice. Well, I, um, undoubtedly we have limitations or, or, or unseen limitations to our, to random thoughts like, um, you know, different people. If you live in, um, if you live in Europe and someone says think of a city and you've never traveled outside Europe, you're probably going to think of a European city or maybe a US city. You're, if you ask someone in India the same question, they're probably going to come up with different, um, different uh, random cities. If you told them to think of a random city. Um, so I, I understand that concept. You know, we're limited well, yeah, uh, well, according let's, to let's, our upbringing and background to a certain extent. Let's do, let's do a little thought experiment now. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a variation on one that, that Sam Harris uh, Sam Harris does that 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 is very much in the area that you're talking about. So let's do it now. Okay. Are you ready? Yep. Okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to think of a flower, any flower at all, and don't tell me which one you've thought of. Okay. Got one? Yep. Okay. Good. That's it. The experiment's finished. Okay. Should we go home? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, did you think of a paphiopedalum? Of course, I did. <laughs> you didn't, did you? <laughs> I don't know. What, what's that? <laughs> it's a shame because they're they're really beautiful flowers. They're a kind of orchid, um, and you know, orchid enthusiasts call them paths for short, and they have a little sort of cult of their own inside the serious orchid fanciers community. Um, they're very unusual, very beautiful, and and uh, and striking flowers. But but why didn't you think of a paphiopedalum? Well, I did first of all, and then I thought, no, nah, no, I'm going to go for a uh, daisy instead. <laughs> See, the 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 point is, I seem to be giving you a very wide choice, right? You can choose any flower at all, but you've got limitations on your choices. The first one is 
there are a whole bunch of flowers whose names you don't know, and you cannot choose any of those flowers. That's right? true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so did you choose da Daisy? Yes, I did, yeah. All right, so why did you choose Daisy? I guess it's probably it was probably um, the first, you know, if, if someone's going to ask me that question, that's there's going to be a certain amount of flowers that instantly pop into my head that have maybe been cropped up in in my mind in the last few years you know Daisy is a there's a popular song Daisy Daisy give me your answer do um, I'm half crazy all for the love of you that I think that that song popped into my head as soon as you said flower so where did um, that come from well um I, I I think it just came from my subconscious so I, I would say that it came did, from so did you think did you think at any point okay try and think of songs that have the names of flowers in them and perhaps there's one that I can use as my flower? No, I, I think what happened was um, throughout my life I'll be presented with all kinds of flowers in um, various forms of media via song, pictures, photos, le mm -hmm. uh, lessons and I think those are the that, that was the group of flowers that I was going to be trawling from and my, my, my subconscious, which I have some influence over in choosing what I want to listen to, etc. Decided on Daisy. All right. Well, look, the Sam Harris argument, and I, and I think it's a, it's a, it's quite a persuasive one. Is this? You can take all the flowers in the world, and I mean, uh, just choosing only orchids. There are forty thousand varieties of orchids in the world, right? All of them are out <laughs> um, because you, you don't know the names of any of them. Okay, they're all technical names that you know only orchid fanciers would know. Um, so straight away, the vast majority of the flowers in the world are out. Then you you are presented from all the names of the flowers you do know. Your subconscious presents you with a few, or maybe just one. You know? the one that it presented you with, it sounds like, was Daisy. You didn't really have an internal conflict. Oh, shall I go Rose? Shall I go Daisy? You didn't really have that. It might have happened though, um, and then you would have to pick one. And you would have a thought, like, oh, I'll go for Daisy because, you know, like, it's the song, I, I like the song. Where does that come from? Do you consciously decide to think to yourself, okay, think that you like that song so that you'll choose Daisy? You, you don't do any of that. That's thinking your thoughts before you think them. It's all your subconscious, paring things down, paring things down, and you might have a thought like, I'll go for Daisy because it's in that song. But that's one of a thousand possible thoughts you could have had, only you were never presented with any of the other 999 thoughts. Your subconscious only presented you with the one, and you went with it. That's true, but... How is that free will? How, where was the free will? Well, there? it's not actually to do so much with free will. That's to do with randomness and... Um I think the, the 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 flower that you'll choose would be based on your life experiences, which you did have some influence over in making choices and decisions. Um, what you've decided to read, what what music you've listened to, your upbringing, yes, and you know all these things will have influenced it. But it's yeah. a ra but that that's to do with randomness. It's not to do with whether I I, I could have made the decision not to answer your question. <laughs> um, so it, it seems to me it's not so much, we can't read too much into that regarding free will. I, yes, but the, look, the argument is basically, um, the, the argument is that, that, that you, you were presented with a choice and, and more so than, than, I mean, you didn't go through all the flowers that you knew and chose the one that you wanted to choose so much as it was just hand to, handed to you by your subconscious brain. Isn't that more to do with logistics though? Like if um if I had pre knowledge uh, that you were going to ask me the question, I could have gone up and uh, gone away for a week and on a retreat and memorized um, learned as many types of flowers as possible, and then my answer would have been uh, would have had a more of a pool of flowers to choose from. Um, but but would that really you, change anything? You're the only person that I know who would who who would. Think of the humorous possibility of going on a flower name learning retreat. <laughs> well, I think I might do it now. Actually, it actually sounds quite nice. Why did you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> it just popped into my head. Exactly. <laughs> um, I, I, I wondered. Um, we've got a mystery guest that's uh, due to come on. Yeah. And um, I thought maybe we could um, contact him shortly and uh, sure. uh, bring him into this this topic. And then he's he wants to talk about an another mystery topic as well. So we always welcome um, any of our listeners to come and join us on Truth Sentinel. And we have a listener who's kindly um, 
agreed to come and join us today. Don Everett Smith Jr., uh, welcome to Truth Sentinel. Um, it's good to have you. Uh, first of all, Scott, thank you so much. And I want to just, uh, before we begin, I want to simply say I've had a chance to look through what Truth Sentinel has done. And uh, you guys are part of carrying the torch uh, because of, uh, I guess you would call it like a brand new media uh, uh, that's been taken over, where you guys are asking the tough questions that, unfortunately, bits and parts of the mainstream uh uh, journalism are just not asking and you guys do it boldly you do it in a very professional manner and uh, you guys do the investigating and asking the big questions that just don't seem to be asked and I just want to congratulate you and say thank you for doing that we need uh, shows like this and podcasts like this to just say you know what um, I don't agree with this or is there a little bit more than what we see here and I just want to simply say thank you for doing that Oh, thanks, Don. Very kind of you to say so. Um, I think yeah, I think you're right that the mainstream media uh, have become a bit sort of sanitised and um, you know maybe a bit politically correct sometimes. And um, I think there's more and more people who are taking to alternative media to try and express their views and and just normal people. Um, you know, uh, it's good to hear the man on the streets' views and and uh, hear listeners as well. We're not trying to be you know um, famous or or become personalities, and uh, we just want to hear what everyone thinks and that's why it's good to hear people like you as well coming on the show and and uh talking about uh topics and first um i, I wanted to ask you what you thought of uh free will and whether you think our lives are kind of preordained and, and or, or whether we have influence over them we make decisions and we have the ability to decide what happens or, or are we um are we a victim of our genetics our upbringing um, our influences, you know, how much do they affect our lives, do you think? I'm going to come at this because I have never shied away from the fact that I am a born-again Christian. I have always, I've grown up in a household where faith and church is very important, very important to me. In fact, I was, uh, I went this morning, uh, and faith is very important to me. I believe the execution of the faith is... The execution of the faith is very important, and um, I had chatted with you beforehand. My basic principle with my faith is don't be a jerk about it. Simple as that. Like, my faith is not a weapon. It is something that should be to bring hope to people. And when it comes to this topic of free will, I mean, obviously, I do very much believe in a very guiding, providential hand of God, but also at the same time, I also very much believe that there is a grander purpose that he has but also another thing though is I believe that also God gives free will and that's part of freedom and I believe that that freedom and that free will to be to choose where to go is something that should be cherished and cultivated now I will admit there's some people that can only go so far I mean like I've I know people that are disabled that their entire life is just a bedroom and a laptop and that's as far as they can go and I believe that certain things are preordained for us that we're kind of stuck with that we have to uh, deal with uh, some people fight alcoholism other people are fighting debt other people are fighting cancer and you kind of go, well, how do you handle that? And I believe that um, there are just some circumstances we have no choice but to face and to take on. And that's where I believe free will comes in, because we can choose to have an attitude. I can sit here and say over and over again, like, oh, I'm having a bad day, I listened to the news, and this sad thing happened. But the thing is, is that I believe that, honestly, free will flat out is a is one of the gifts from God. I mean, that was one of the things. Uh, if you go back and you read Genesis, that it was one of the first things he gave people. And I'm a huge, huge um, proponent of defending that right of free will, defending that. Now, whether it's there or not, I on some level obviously believe that there is a free will that we execute and that we uh, go forward in. But my attitude is, is that I believe that people have the right uh, it's one of the things that um, very much God does say, hey, I've got a plan, you can be a part of it or not be a part of it, that's your choice. And um, But also at the same time, I believe that he does 
uh, that was one of the things that does need to be defended. And it's one of the reasons why, again, I complimented your show because there is so much out there that is trying to get us to think the same way on one thing, that is trying to get us to have the same opinion, to like the same things, or to kind of over here be a distraction to something while some, while some other underhanded shenanigans goes on. So that, that sort of thing is, uh, that really, really on some level, really just, I, I can't get over just how much people need to be told, hey, look, you have a brain, you use it. I mean, it's like free will. I mean, it's much the same way. What do you want? Do you want, uh, do, do you want to have a chocolate bar for dinner, or do you want to have a salad? What, like, there are obvious consequences too. If you have a chocolate bar every single night for dinner, you're going to put on weight. If you have a salad, you're going to look pretty good and handsome, like you guys. <laughs> so, I mean, it's <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of like how, how do you do that? What do you do? And that's why, to me, I really genuinely do believe in free will. I was going to say to you, Anthony, what about the spiritual and and faith and fate? This is something that's um, often ignored by neuroscientists, and I know Sam Harris brought up um, about the soul that even people can't even choose their own soul. So uh, even if if you even if you bring into the equation of people believing in that they have a soul, they still can't choose their soul. So you know they yeah. they they still don't have free will. But yeah. they do they yeah, do seem to right. ignore um, spirituality, and and there does seem to be like a hidden kind of force that some people call fate and uh, I experienced it last night playing playing uh, a game of risk which is like a <laughs> world world domination game with my friend and oh my God. and uh, he rolled six sixes in a row, a row <laughs> nice. and defeated me uh, and I just couldn't believe it and uh, but it, it seems like there was a, a, a hidden force at play there <laughs> I will say it let me interrupt Anthony real, twi- uh, real sure, quick yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. I'm just going to simply say your friend's a tool of the devil that's the only way he could win <laughs> Scott, that, that, I'm going to tell him later yeah, <laughs> yeah. <I> t- <laughs> actually uh, Don when you mentioned um, people in uh, who, who have adverse circumstances in their lives uh, because I'm in Poland at the moment um, I thought of um, I thought of a singer called uh, Monika Kuszynska Monika Kuszynska was this year's uh, Polish entry to the Eurovision Song Contest. And uh, <laughs> you see, we are highbrow and intellectual here at Trent yes. Sentinel. <laughs> um, but, but she was notable because she was the first uh, Eurovision Song Contest entrant to be wheelchair bound. And she was wheelchair bound because uh, she was in a car accident in which she nearly died. Uh, so she has a beautiful voice naturally and oh. she she entered this contest and sang a song of hope you know a, a kind of a, a, a whatever the adverse circumstances of your life don't give up you know like life can be beautiful whatever your situation type of song so i mean she's clearly a very strong person and and from one point of view you could say probably a great um advertisement for free will but listening to the song, this is this is my my question, and I think it's also kind of Sam Harris's question. Uh, two people who are listening to the song. Let's imagine there are two people listening to Monica Kuszynska uh, singing about you know her overcoming her troubles to to lead a beautiful life. Uh, both of them have a drug problem, and one of them says, "All right, she's right. Her problems are worse than mine, and she got over them. So it's time to just man up and get over it." And the other continues doing what they're doing. Is that an exercise of free will, or are those people bound by their experiences and their genes and their personalities? One bound to accept the message, and one bound to reject the message. Well, it's funny you should say that with drug addiction, is because drug addiction is very, very, very powerful. Um, I uh, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit trail, but it's one I know very well. And I, uh, I'm a very, very, very strong proponent of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and their books. And they talk about this very thing. They do mention that there are people that have, or excuse me, the big book that they call an Alcoholics Anonymous. There are some people that are just so far down the trail that there's nothing that they can do to come back. However, there's other people that can, uh, that are able to do that by working the program and having what is called the spiritual experience. 
Mm-hmm. And um, and I don't mean to go this go back this in a spiritual experience, but when, if you're using an example like drug addiction, drug addiction is one of those things that has just clouded a mind so badly that you have no choice. It's like almost like you're not that far from being one of those things running around the Walking Dead, <laughs> where it's just kind of like I the only thing that I will just keep going forward, and maybe I'll stop at a wall, and I'm just looking for something to feed on, and that's mm-hmm. basically what drug addiction turns the addict. So at some point in time, someone has to hit some sort of bottom, where you go, this is the line, this is it. To quote Popeye, this is all I can stand, I can't stand no more. And you go, I'm going to get help for this. And somebody like that, the two people, yeah, it, it, there are some people that just give up. That's what it boils down to, is, is that there's so many people in life that they go, I just give up. That's it. I'm done. And they don't get in there and do the work. Because life is not easy. It is Life is not easy. It is a very hard road to, road to um Ho, uh, to borrow more cliches, and I promise I will be saying more cliches as I continue on. Um, I was just going to interrupt slightly here, sure. sorry, because um, we we're a bit limited for time. So sure. I wanted to um, to ask you if um, we could move on to your main topic today, which you were going to talk about, which I haven't told uh, Anthony about. Um, our mystery topic. <laughs> Gotcha. All right. I will be very quick because all of this fits into it. Mm -hmm. Um, Here is the mystery topic, literal mystery topic, Anthony. Um, I have started a website called The Sherlock Conversations. It's found found at thesherlockconversations.wordpress.com. And it is also, I've started a Facebook page called uh, facebook.com backslash Sherlock Conversations. And my goal is to share some of the aspects that I have learned from reading, uh, from rereading uh, the Sherlock Holmes canon, written the way Arthur Conan Doyle did it. And one of the things that I really appreciated about the Sherlock Holmes canon is what really got me to it is when I read in a study in Scarlet how Watson began listing all of like the things that Holmes were into. Oh, he was into this. Holmes like that doesn't know a thing about this. And then they got into this topic of astronomy. And Holmes basically says, he's like, what, what, uh, I'm going to see if I can actually get, uh, I want to see if I can get the right quote for the, this. Holmes basically says, he goes, what does it matter if I go around the sun or if the earth goes around the sun, or it goes around the moon, how's that going to help my work? And how I basically have interpreted that is, what Sherlock has done is, he has gotten to a point where he has been able to say, I'm going to push all of this out of my brain, all the unnecessary information out of my brain. I'm not going to get involved in petty squabbles. I'm not going to get involved with, he said this about me and that hurts my feelings. I'm not going to get involved with watching reality TV show. I'm not going to get involved listening to horrible music on basic um, on basic top 40 radio. I'm not going to listen to any of that. What I'm going to be into is just going straight forward into focusing what I need to focus in on. Here's the quote that he says. What the deuce is it to me? You say that we go around the sun? If we go around the moon, it would make, it would not make a penny worth of difference to me or to my work. And then he further adds, no man burdens his mind with small matters unless he has some very good reason for doing so. So the reason why I have decided to really add to the voice of Sherlockians and add to this perspective is I like pushing this this desire of, you know, let's just push away the silly things that we don't need in our life. It doesn't matter. Like, what are some of the things that I can focus in on? And sometimes they're like, it's almost like a codependency where I almost have to be up in arms. Uh, it's sort of like I was upset with the shooting of Cecil the Lion. But at some point, Cecil's death and the idiot that killed him are not going to have an effect on my life. And I need to step back and let this go and think whatever happens, happens. And so 
I need to focus in on my personal stuff. And this is one of the reasons why I became such a fan of Sherlock and why I reread the stories. I watch the TV shows. I've gone back. I've been watching some of the Basil Rathbone stuff. Is because you see little iotas and little pieces of that. And that's basically what I was here, uh, what, what uh, Scott has been kind enough to let me come on and uh, talk about today. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, we spend a lot of time... Uh worrying and fretting and and talking about and listening to to stuff maybe that doesn't matter uh, i guess we have to work out what does matter and what doesn't matter but i saw a bit of sherlock holmes tonight uh, the british version i know i know the american tv program if we're talking about the tv program that is of course um is is, is different but he looks at people and he works out a lot of information just by things he can see that's one of his skills um yeah very observational just by taking a look at someone and say like oh i can tell that you were over on 8th avenue and the guy's like how, how did you know that and he's like well you've got this little stub there that's from this on there and then i know that they're doing construction work over on 8th avenue da, 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 da. and it's just and that's part of the fun of it that's like just one of the things that he does and that's and that was all based around some of the things that um dr joseph bell did like joseph bell could look at someone and just diagnose but just diagnosed like the guy didn't say a thing and he'd be like oh you're here because you have a cold <laughs> really how do you know well because you've got this kleenex tucked in there and it doesn't look like something that i want to touch <laughs> yeah yeah what do you think what... anthony do you think um we do spend too much time focusing on things that maybe we could we could get rid of and just focus on the things that matter uh, i think that's a very difficult question it's difficult to find the balance sometimes especially between looking out at the world and and looking i suppose into yourself and and at the people around you you know who you care about and uh because looking out into the world is often a very disturbing experience <laughs> uh but at the same time if nobody had cared about the cecil the lion killing for example then that guy would have just gone on doing what he was doing and and uh and, you know, I suppose justice wouldn't have been done. But more importantly, he may have gone on to to kill again. Uh, so so it's kind of it is it's it's in find, finding that balance. I think you can't you can't, you know, take the world's problems on onto your shoulders 24 seven because you go insane. But uh, it also it, it, it frustrates me a little bit when people don't um, step outside of themselves. And I, I want to just briefly relate an experience that I had about I guess three years ago, I was in a, a language school in Ukraine and uh, it was just announced that the, um, that the Ukrainian government was adopting similar laws to what the Russian government had, had adopted, which are the anti-homosexual propaganda laws. Now, they, the laws basically say that it's, that it's illegal to, to disseminate homosexual propaganda. But what they're actually saying is if we find out that you're a homosexual, we can come to your home and arrest you. Uh, and, and there's a very strong undertone in the, in the laws, as they stand, that, that homosexuals are all pedophiles. Now, we know in the West that homosexuals are not all pedophiles. But this, no. myth, this, this myth persists. That's hard to say. <laughs> this myth persists in, in former Soviet countries, and it's used to, to, to victimize a portion of the, of the community. So this, this law came into effect <clears throat> on a day when I happened to be in this language school and the foreigners who worked in the language school were all having a discussion about it, about it. You know, some of them were, were pro gay rights, some of them not so much. Uh, but they were, they were discussing it as a kind of current topical issue. The local teachers who were teaching there in, in school had nothing to say about it and it's their country. And it was an important legal change that came into yeah. force on that day. I found that a really dispiriting experience because it meant we don't care about 10% of our community. We don't have a strong opinion for them. We don't have a strong opinion against them. We just don't care about them at all. And the government can do with them whatever it wants. And I think, I think that a, a society who feels that way is going to be abused. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, you, like I say, it's, it's part of fi finding that balance. You do have to, sometimes look out into the world and become concerned about things but you also have to leave enough time for yourself and also i guess um decide whether it's things that you can do anything about if you can't change anything 
um, in any way at all, then is is there any point uh, discussing it? But but Don, what other things can we learn from uh, Sherlock Holmes? Well, like I said, I mean, like the big the big thing has been like m- learning how to focus, because that's that's probably his greatest ability is his ability to focus, and then before he makes an educated guess, he has as much information as he needs. Because one of the things was, and I read this from uh, uh, an amazing book called Mastermind by Maria um, Castillo. Oh my gosh. I'm going to ruin her last name. It's like a very, very uh, Russian last name. It's like Maria Kostova. And I did an interview with her a, a long time ago, about two years, a year and a half ago maybe. About, and, um, and I have that posted on the Sherlock site. And one of the things that she says in her book is, Sherlock may not have all the information in front of him, but he will have a plan on how to get that information. Because that's the other thing when it comes to problem-solving skills. We, uh, a- Anthony um, said it earlier when he says that when you look at the problems of the world, you could be overwhelmed and would drive you insane. So you come up with a plan to focus on what is right in front of you, even if it's just a very basic thing. And this is a 12-step, basically when we were talking about the 12-step program earlier, one day at a time, one step at a time, where it's sort of like, what can I chow- What can I deal with? Well, right now, deal with the thing that is immediately in front of you. Like if you look at your house and you're going, oh my gosh, my whole pl- house is cluttered. I need to clean it up. I've got my mother-in-law coming and I want this place to look nice. What do I do? Well, where are you standing at the moment? I'm in my living room. Okay, what is on your couch? Um, well, all these old newspapers. Then work on that. And what I usually find is by doing something like that, I'm then able to then come up with a plan on the next, after I do this, I'll do the chair, then I'll get the vacuum, and then there, I've done with the living room. Then I go after the bedroom. And that's the way Sherlock Holmes approached. He would go, what is in front of me? And he would have a plan for it. If he didn't have the information, he would have a plan on how to get the information. And he did it one step at a time. He went with the people that were near him. It was one of the reasons why he sent out the Baker Street Irregulars. He couldn't find information. It's like he'd be looking for a carriage with a certain uh, person's name in it. And he wouldn't know where to look for that. Or there'd be like London in 1890s is filled with like hundreds and hundreds of carriages. And who has that type of time? So what he did was he would send out the people. And he would send out the ones nearest him. And he'd basically go, okay, here's a pound or whatever they had for British currency at that time. And they would say, Here, here's a pound, here's a penny, whatever. Go find this information and he would send it out amongst them and then they would come back to him with the information. So that's the other thing is whatever it is that you have in life, have a plan of attack and then then do with what is near you. Do Take care of what is nearest to you first. You want to change the world? You're tired of the poverty? What is nearest to you? For me, there are food pantries that are near me within 10 minutes' drive. If I care about that, if that's where my focus is, I'm going to go in that direction. That's the sort of thing that people need to do instead of worrying about, like, again, I'll I'll say this, the Cecil the Lion thing, using that as an example, of course I was upset and I was offended uh, um, by the actions of this idiot man. But at some point in time, I have to put that anger behind me and know, am I in Zimbabwe? No. Do I live near Minneapolis where this guy lived uh, to write about him and to question him and to ask him what he think, why he did this and to get an answer from that? No, I'm nowhere near that. But what I can do is if it inspires me to do something about that, I'm going to be a little bit extra nicer to my cats or I will go and volunteer at an animal shelter. That sort of thing. I think that's, I think that's a very good idea actually. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, we, you know, with some of the topics we've discussed on past shows, you sometimes feel helpless, like, you know, how can you possibly affect these things? And the, at the end of the day, you can't in, in a lot of cases. And I think it's good, yeah, to, to change the world around you, as um, Gandhi, I think, said as well. And, uh, you know, create and improve your own uh, surroundings and, and be good to other people and try and do your own thing. But you're not, you know, and that's the only... That's the only way you can really see some of the improvements happening around. What What do you think, Anthony? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And and again, I'm I'm going to come in here with an anecdote. <laughs> I hope it's not too far off the point. Uh, 
so last year we had the um the Sydney siege, which we talked about on the program, and uh, where where an absolute nutcase walked into a cafe and 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 took its occupants hostage, and eventually three people in the cafe died. Uh, the nutcase in question was claiming to act on behalf of Islamic State. He actually did. He he had no connection with with the Islamic State at all. But that's another story. Uh, there were reprisals against Muslims in Australia. Um, for example, there was one Muslim woman that was pushed off a moving train in Melbourne. Uh, but there was also something which happened. Uh, it was it was a hashtag that, that that cropped up on Twitter, and it was called uh, "Ride with Me." And people who wrote messages to or to that hashtag were saying, uh, basically, if you're a Muslim. In an Australian city, and you're feeling under threat, um, I'll pick you up in my car and take you home, so you'll be safe. And and that's dealing with what's in front of you. Um, that's saying, all right, there are these huge world issues, but but what it comes down to is, you're a person, I'm a person, you're in danger, I will help you. Uh, and so I think that's a, probably a very good example of, of what you're that's, talking about. That's an absolutely amazing example of that sort of thing because that, that's one of the things that's so great about that. That's a way of helping out by thinking outside the box. That's actually step two in this, doing something like thinking outside the box. Step uh, is more or less like let's do it in a different way. Um, t today, uh, real quick, um, not to go beat on this, I was listening in church, and they were talking about the story of uh, um, Jesus healed a man that, that was lowered in a bed. He had, like The house that Jesus was in was completely surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of people, and these four guys uh, climbed up on top of the roof with their friend, and they basically cut out the ceiling and lowered this guy down and basically said, hey, can you heal the guy? Mm -hmm. And there's a level of thinking about that that I, I admire. Like These are guys that are just saying, like, all right, we're surrounded by this, and we're surrounded by this crowd of people. All right, sorry, Joe, we're going to have to take you home. You're in trouble. And what I admired about these guys was these four guys said, no, this is the best, this is the best source of healing for our friend, and, I, and we're going to do it. And I'm sure they had to pay repair damages. Unfortunately, that's not mentioned in Luke. Because I, uh, I was even thinking the owner of the house must have been screaming up a storm. Like, what are you doing? Uh, so I'm like, I put a nail in the wrong spot, and I'm afraid that my landlord's going to come down and say something to me. So, I mean, it, it's that sort of thing. It's this thinking outside the box. And so for these people to go, all right, let's extend humanity and kindness to Muslims. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be right there to pick you up. That that sort of thing absolutely moves me and just restores my faith. That when I hear about something like the killing of Cecil, it restores my faith and it gives me something positive to focus in on. And I think that's that's just an awesome story and just goes to show you how awesome Australians are. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, I just wanted to say that um, that that that's that's a great way, a great moral to have on today's show is deal deal with what's in front of you. And if anyone out there is uh, pondering on a decision uh, at the moment and not sure what to do, then that's a good uh, good place to start. Deal with what's in front of you, and um, you know, of course, there's a debate as to whether you you actually can make that decision yourself. But um, well, we'll probably come back to this topic in the future. And uh, I'm sorry, Don, we probably run out of time today, but that's um, fine. It, this has it been was, my uh, pleasure. It will. It's great talking to you, and you're you're welcome to come back on again anyway, and uh, talk about uh, continue with this topic or another one. It's it was been great uh, talking to you, um, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, and Anthony, it's been my pleasure today to speak with you as well. Thank you so much for both of you to have me on. Well, the pleasure was all mine, Don. It was really good to talk to you. I hope you will come on again. Oh, I would love to come on. I'm a comic book writer, so I got stuff to plug. <laughs> um, well, talking about plugging, Don, what, um, where can people find out uh, about your Sherlock blogs? Oh, okay, they can go to the um, they can go to Sherlock Conversations, all one word. dot wordpress. dot com, and they can also I spend a lot of time on the Facebook page, which is Facebook. dot com backslash Sherlock Conversations. And Anthony just liked it, so that means Anthony is awesome in so many different. He's <laughs> awesome all around the world now. At this point, in Australia, Poland, and wherever else he is, and now in the United States. So, Anthony, you're always welcome here. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> oh, and you too. <laughs> but 
for for listeners, uh, if you if you want to find the Facebook page, if you type the Sherlock conversations into Google, the Facebook page will come up. It's about the fourth link on the list. Oh, very cool. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And Scott, you're always welcome too. Thank you, Don. Thank you very much. And um, I, as this is the end of the show, I'm going to have to say uh, thank you to you, Anthony, as well, and um, for for joining us today. And um, hope you'll join us again uh, shortly. And I'm not sure what the next topic is, but we'll think of one. I'm sure we will. <laughs> <laughs> so thank thanks everyone and catch you both later. All right, bye bye. Take care. Take it easy. <laughs>